In the previous video, we covered all the beginner topics at a high level. Today, we'll go over 23 advanced coding topics, which are widely used in the industry. So we already know how to write and use code, but we still don't know all of its capabilities. Extension methods are neat. They are normal static methods, which can be called from anywhere in our code, but with a tiny cool twist. By using the this keyword, we can flip the code order around for a shorter and more readable flow. At the top of the iceberg, we mentioned OOP, but now it's time to dive deeper into code abstractions. You probably use generics without even knowing, like when creating a list or event of a specific type. Generics allow our simple class, which is dependent on a single type, to support any type we want by changing it to be a generic of type reward and adding this reward class. This way we can choose the type upon initialization. Now, as you see, we don't want a reward service because reward is only meant to be a base class that shares common properties and has no meaning on its own. In such a case, we should mark it as an abstract class. And if there are methods or properties that shouldn't have an implementation, we should mark them abstract as well. This forces their implementation on the inheriting class, just like an interface. Then rises the popular interview question. What's the difference between an interface and an abstract class? Well, abstract class is an interface on steroids. They both define some method structure and can't be initialized. But if we want methods implementations in an interface, we need to dirty our code with an ugly casting. Not like with abstract class, which is designed to have fields and methods with implementations. Though of course, this comes at a great cost of wasting our single inheritance. In c a class can inherit from only one base class, because if we could inherit from multiple classes, it could lead to conflicts between them. The solution? Composition over inheritance. Composition is the simpler approach. Instead of inheriting from a class, we just hold a reference to the class itself. Let's view a common use case where composition beats inheritance. With inheritance, while extending our code structure, we may run into a problem that our class won't be able to inherit two classes. Such a shame our vampire won't be able to attack and heal. Though with composition, we can isolate the logic into subclasses, which will be composed into our class. Feel free to pause to digest the details, or even better, check out Code Aesthetic's great video about this topic. Also notice how much extra code we had to add to make this work. Sometimes it's worth it, but other times it might just be premature optimization. c -sharp also has some useful built-in interfaces that comes with great functionality. For instance, implementing iComparable, which lets us sort easily a list of objects. Or of course, our beloved iDisposable, which we already have a full video about. A topic which was hard for us at first to comprehend is delegates. So let's clear the air on this topic. Just as string is a type for text, delegate is a type for methods. Thankfully, we don't have to declare it every time. Instead, we can use actions, which are exactly the same. Even better, we don't need a separate method. We can create one on the fly using lambda expressions. And you're probably familiar with Unity's action mimic, the Unity action. But we'll get to that later. And of course, when invoked, they all perform the same. Pop quiz. Which of the following generates the least memory allocation? Assigning to a delegate a lambda expression, static method, or class method. Well, the winner is the lambda expression. But why? The reason is pretty surprising. The first time it's called, it caches the delegate for future use, meaning every subsequent call generates zero garbage. We've included a great article in the description, which explains this in detail. So, don't always listen to what your IDE is suggesting you. But how are delegates useful? We can use them to inject logic into another method, to pass callback methods as parameters, or to listen to, like events. So why the hell do we need events? Let's modify the mission service to understand. Event is the delegate's protector. It's blocking external classes from directly assigning it to a different method or invoking it. So a rule of thumb, events are stationary while delegates are passed around. Just as Lambda expressions are anonymous methods, tuples are anonymous classes. 
For instance, if we want a method to return multiple parameters, instead of writing an entire struct just for that, with tuples, it's possible to create an instance of a class without the overhead of defining the class itself. Just be careful. Since tuples are much less readable, and passing around an object that we can't find its usages sounds like a bad idea, only use tuples in small, independent methods where defining a struct feels like an overkill. This is particularly useful when using tasks, which don't support out parameters. Similar to coroutines, if our methods require more time, we could use tasks to wait for each line asynchronously. But with tasks, we can upgrade this by executing all the methods in parallel. Now, because tasks work on a separate thread from Unity's main thread, in practice, we avoid using them. And instead, there are similar approaches for multi-threading and async programming, which we will cover later. Beyond lists and dictionaries, we have more complex data structures, such as two-dimensional arrays or trees. Though there isn't a standard tree data structure, because there are so many ways to implement it. .NET has many useful namespaces packed with pre-written code we get for free. Link provides a nice syntax to perform useful operations on data structures, like saving multiple lines of loop iterations. Though probably the experienced of you just felt sick a little, because although Link is convenient, it's slower and allocates more memory. But honestly, unless you're working on performance critical scenarios, like in an update function, this is super negligible. The math class is a straightforward one. It holds the famous math constants and lets us perform math operations. Note that under the Unity Engine namespace, we have another math class which is more suitable for Unity because it uses float. And if you're using Unity's Burst compiler, you should use the math class under the Unity Mathematics namespace, which takes full advantage of our CPU for even faster math operations. System I.O. stands for Input Output and allows us to modify our file system paths, create directories, or files. The system text namespace, as you might guess, lets us manipulate text. Its features aren't used often but can be incredibly powerful when needed. Regular expressions, known as regex, help us find patterns within a string by using a variety of rule formats. But let's face it, they're not the most intuitive, so nobody really bothers to know all the rules by heart and just search them when needed, exactly like we did. String Builder is considered an advanced tool, perfect for creating long strings when performance matters like saving your half a million contacts into one string. If we run this using String Builder, it finishes after 54 milliseconds. And now let's do this the standard way, with normal strings concatenation. Eight thousand four hundred times slower. So how is this magic possible? Once you see what's under the hood, it's actually pretty simple. String Builder, as its name suggests, builds the string one on top of the other, and then merges them into one string. While string, on the other hand, copies the entire string each time. And that, of course, has a very poor exponential growth. The other results demonstrate this perfectly. Reflection is a very powerful tool. It lets us cheat and analyze our own code, like getting a type's fields or checking if a field is serialized field just what we need for detecting all the null serialized fields in our scene. But beware, reflection is slower than Unity answering my feature requests. Just for reference, it's more than 500 times slower getting a field value through reflection versus the normal way. So please keep it for non-production code. Reflection goes hand in hand with attributes. Attributes let us add custom metadata to our code, like the famous serialized field, which tells Unity to display the field in the editor or the context menu attribute, which lets us easily invoke a method from the editor. And we can even write our own custom attributes and detect them with reflection. No matter what language you're using, there are general topics you must be familiar with. One of the core topics is design patterns. Design patterns are proven solutions to common problems, which are here to save us from reinventing the wheel, like using the facade pattern for denying straight access to our business logic. There are many more design patterns for different purposes, but don't feel overwhelmed. It's tough to remember all of them, and even harder to master. So at this stage, we would recommend practicing a few patterns, and to only be familiar with the others. So the next time a senior dev suggests using an adapter pattern, you'll understand what they mean. 
Moving on. If you ever recorded your recorder, congrats, you used recursion. Recursion, by definition, is when a method calls itself. This technique is particularly useful in scenarios where a problem can be divided into similar subproblems, like finding all enemies within a radius, then finding all enemies within each of their radiuses, and so on. Perfect for chaining a powerful lightning attack. We highly recommend mastering it. It can be a lifesaver, and interviewers love catching us off guard on this topic. Because we're all decent human beings who care about each other's sanity, we follow the coding standards, which are simple rules that keep our code readable and maintainable. But unfortunately, today, each company still has its own coding standards variation, so each time we need to adapt. A good starting point would be Microsoft's standards, linked in the description. To measure code performance, we use the computational complexity theory. Although it sounds scary, at its core it's pretty simple. Usually, performance is measured by the algorithm's worst-case scenario. For instance, to check if all numbers in an array of size n are above a certain threshold, we might need to enter the loop up to n times. However, at a two-dimensional array of size n, we might need to go through nested loops up to n times, while each loop has n iterations, resulting in an n-squared complexity. And there are many more complexity levels. Performance has its eternal nemesis, memory. By strategically sacrificing a bit of memory, we can often achieve significant improvements in code performance. In addition, it's crucial to understand how our computer's memory works, what's stored on the stack, what's allocated on the heap, and the different memory hardwares. We saved the most important topic for last. The solid principles were initially planned to be at the bottom of the iceberg. But our friends insisted it's a must-know for every junior developer. These five simple guidelines form the bedrock of clean code, and mastering them can make a world of difference in your code quality and readability. Probably the most recognized principle is single responsibility, which states that each class should have only one responsibility and therefore only one reason to change, requiring us to divide it into smaller decoupled classes. And don't worry, if books aren't your thing, we highly recommend Uncle Bob's video series on clean code, linked in the description. So this episode turned out much longer than we expected. We've finally covered all the advanced coding topics, and in the next video, we'll explore the advanced Unity topics every junior must master. Enjoyed the video? Share it with your friends, and show us that love with a thumbs up and subscribe. And thanks a lot for watching. We hope to see you soon in another Practic API video.